Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, or good, or good evening. I guess it depends on wherever you are. So welcome to uh, the session of CIAT uh, at TCT 2021. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Dr. Park, Dr. Park uh, and uh, the organizer of TCTAP, uh, who invited us to participate uh, every year. So this year, as, as usual, we have um, our own the dedicated session. Um, this year, the theme would be ship uh, with limited resource or life without fancy devices. With me here today, my co-moderator, Dr. Virat K. Hasukjaran, Dr. Virat. And uh, we also have uh, sets of lecturers, case presenters, and panelists. Dr. Siri Thai Chi Wat Tanakon Kun from Sopranakarin. Dr. Durakani Wat from Siri Thai Hospital. Dr. Durak Jiam Lukun Git from Police General Hospital. Dr. Supawat Ratanapo from the Royal Army Hospital. Dr. Tanawat Sisa from Konken uh, Hospital. And Dr. Nick Woodwalker from Siri Thai Hospital. Hello. So without further ado, um, Dr. Greg, could you kindly uh, 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 introduce uh, the first session of, of this? Session? Yes, thank you. Uh, the first lecture will be given by uh, Dr. Sri Chai from uh, Princess uh, Songkha University Hospital in Songkha, Nakhine. And uh, the topic is the mechanical circulation support in Thailand. What are our options? Uh, please, Dr. Sri Chai. Okay, so uh, I'd like to start. Uh, my topic is uh, mechanical surgery support uh, in Thailand. What are our options? So I, I have no conflict of interest to declare. So here's uh, the list that uh, I will go through. And uh, I will first uh, start with the, why do we need uh, such a mechanical surgery support devices? So uh, first of all, because of we are getting more and more the chip cases. And as you know, the chip cases uh, we, we are dealing with today is associated with some uh, complication. So it would be nice to have some uh, device uh, like uh, to, to, to save the patient just in case. And the second is uh, the mortality in the cardiogenic shock still remain uh, the same despite we uh, improve quality of care a lot, like uh, in uh, AMI cardiogenic shock. Uh, I the uh, primary PCI increase uh, dot, uh, primary PCI rate and uh, decrease dot to balloon and networking that the mortality is still the same. And as you can see on the slides from the uh, shock registry and shock trial, the cardiac power was uh, strongly associated with mortality. So it, if we have, uh, if we can uh, improve the cardiac power by in, improve the cardiac output or increase the mean arterial pressure, we might increase the chance of the survival and might improve the patient outcomes. And uh, the, the last reason why do we need the mechanical support device because of the, this, the device that have an ability to stabilize the, uh, the hemodynamic and bridge the patient to uh, recovery, to the decision, and maybe some uh, to transplantations. And these are uh, uh, many uh, critical applications that uh, circulatory support have been uh, tested and used. Uh, but the most, uh, pop the most popular one is uh, uh, cardiogenic shock and, uh, uh, and uh, high-risk PCI. And there are some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, institution used for myocardial salvage in the setting of uh, acute MI. Here's uh, the current available uh, MCS uh, in, uh, uh, in the market. But uh, for us, we have only the IABP and the uh, VA ECMO machine. Uh, so uh, it's not uh, difficult to choose because we have only two. So, uh, uh, we, I, I would like to start the, the how, how to select the MCS devices. Uh, first of all, uh, we have to understand the uh, hemodynamic support equations. 
uh, the good MCS device or the ideal MCS device should have the ability uh, to increase the circulatory support to uh, to to unload the ventricle that we call a ventricular support or maybe uh, to uh, increase the coronary perfusion uh, that we call a coronary perfusion support. By, uh, by using the MCS device uh, to increase the mean arterial pressure and cardiac output, we can have uh, uh, improve, uh, we can improve the systemic perfusions. And by uh, uh, decrease the LV pressure and LV volume by using an MCS device, we can uh, decrease the cardiac workload. So improve the, the, uh, uh, the myocardial protections. And also we can increase the perfusion pressure uh, by using the MCS devices. And uh, as you can see on the slides, uh, there are many uh, different devices in the market. And uh, here's uh, uh, the diagram show how much the support of the device uh, provides to the patient. As you can see, the best is the VA ECMO. We can achieve for five to seven leads per minute to the patient. But the worst is uh, the IABP that we uh, clearly use uh, a lot because of this improve uh, the perfusion just only five, five, uh, 0 0.5 to one lead per minute. However, this is the most uh, commonly used in the market. And uh, as you know, the IABP uh, by just place the balloon in the descending aorta inflate and deflate. Uh, they use uh, the, the diastolic augmentation and systolic unload theory to improve the core perfusion. But uh, the most important one is uh, there's no active mechanical augmentation of the cardiac output provided by IABP. Uh, but uh, there's still some advantages from IABP because of IABP. Uh, come with the small cannula and it's required only for millimeter femoral artery and uh, easy to install. But uh, I have to emphasize that uh, the disadvantage is uh, it provides us just 0.5 lead per minute of the cardiac output and is relying on the synchronization of the cardiac cycles uh, and may not be reliable in the severe arrhythmia and that it needs a uh, native LV function to, to be worked with and uh, is also some uh, associated with the, some uh, complications like uh, embolization, stroke, infection, and hemorrhoids. So for the AABP, uh, we have three mark, three check mark, but a limited uh, security support. How about the impeller devices? Impeller devices is the micro axial pump system such as the blood from the vertical to the aorta and trigately. There are uh, so many kinds of catheters that depend on the, how much uh, support we need. And uh, it's a single muscular access devices, but we need uh, 5.5 millimeters uh, diameter for the impella CP and 8 millimeter for uh, uh, impella 5.0 and need the cut down. And as you can see on the slides, uh, the uh, mechanism of the impella suck the blood out of the ventricle and uh, uh, push the blood forward into the ascending aorta. It creates the direct unloading of the left ventricle and uh, systemic uh, hemodynamic support for the systemic perfusion. So the impella, we have three marks for, um, from these uh, equations. How about the ECMO machine? Uh, ECMO machine, uh, as you know, is a couple of, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass uh, devices that draw the blood from the right atrium uh, to the to the uh, oxygenator and return the blood back to the aorta in the retrograde fashions. And it provides us uh, three to seven liters per minute. And uh, uh, the drawback is uh, it's a dual vascular access uh, devices and uh, the device is uh, huge. And uh, the cannula is huge, like 18 to 24 French for venous cannula. And it's, uh, it has some complex uh, management uh, problems. And as you can see on the slide, is uh, there are so many configuration of cannulation strategy, but uh, the most widely used in the cat lab is the uh, peripheral uh, ECMO machine. And here's uh, the, the, the cartoon show the, how much uh, complexity of the, the device. If you put the ECMO inside the patient, so you clear the dual uh, circulations one circulation in the in the patient and one circulation from the ECMO machine. And somehow they mix up in the ascending or descending aorta is depend on the, the native the cardiac output of the patients. 
So the uh, ECMO has uh, some limitation in molecular support. Some institution, they use a combination of these devices, but I don't want to go into the detail. And there are some limitation of these devices, like uh, IABP, we cannot use in the severe aortic regurgitation and peripheral artery disease. And uh, for the infant we cannot use that in the LV thrombus, mechanical aortic valve, or severe aortic stenosis. And this technology comes with the price to pay. And uh, the most one is uh, the vascular bleeding and vascular complication, as you can see. Um, how about the clinical application? We can use that in high risk and cardiogenic shock. For the high risk uh, PCI, first we have to decide who should uh, we use uh, the, these devices. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, the good consensus about the definition of high risk PCI. But uh, in general, uh, if the patient have the several comorbidity and uh, complex coronary anatomy like uh, multivessel disease, left main disease, or uh, LV, severe LV dysfunction, we consider this patient as a high risk PCI and we need to protect the patients. Uh, the clinical study, uh, we don't have much data about the IABP, but there's one uh, study, PCI uh, S1 study uh, in UK and uh, randomization uh, use uh, IABP or no IABP. And as you can see, there are some trends in decreased mortality, but not risk that is of this uh, significant at six months. How about the impella? As you can see, there's a several study, but small study. And uh, there's uh, the most important one is PROTECT2. Uh, uh, randomization between uh, IABP versus uh, impella in high-risk PCI. Again, a trend to decrease the major adverse event, but not risk statistical this uh, significant. And uh, how about the ECMO? Uh, ECMO, as you can see on the slides, are uh, the, the the upper the upper one is uh, show us uh, the increased procedure mobility in high risk PCI. So ECMO should not be the front line MCI device in high risk PCI. So. Uh, this is uh, the statement from the uh, from the uh, the uh, the ACC how to use the device in high risk PCI. Uh, they they advocate use the impella first, but if you have a limitation to impella, use the IABP. But I think some somehow we, we can use that as a bailout just by by just uh, insert the five French small French uh, sheet in the contralateral size uh, for rapid exchange just in case if you need. How about the cardiogenic shock? As you all know, uh, uh, IABP shock to trial uh, comparing the IABP versus uh, no IABP negative outcome. Um, so uh, the IABP in cardiogenic shocks uh, was downgraded to uh, not routine use as class three. How about the MCS device like Impella versus IABP? Here is a meta-analysis of the device comparing uh, MCS device, uh, Impella, and them had and uh, IABP again no mortality benefit but a small small uh, number of the patient and uh, how about the ECMO the ECMO is uh, we have only few data only the QC that suggests the benefit of this but we have to wait for the upcoming trial uh, what the guidelines say the guidelines say that the MCS device uh, in cardiology should be uh, in the class two B and uh, why do we have a negative outcome try? I think because uh, maybe uh, we, we have a wrong selection about the patient selection. Uh, from the uh, shock registry, uh, we know that 50% uh, will survive without any device and 40 to 50% do not survive. However, if we use the mechanical support device in uh, this patient, the patient we would maybe uh, suffer from the complication and maybe die from the, the uh, MCS device complication. However, if we use this device in, uh, in this uh, patient population, uh, somehow we can uh, save some patient uh, like 25%. However, uh, there's, there's also uh, some patient will die anyway because of anoxic brain and death of sepsis. Uh, so the answer is uh, maybe we can we don't. We should not use the cohort in the cohort A. We should use in cohort B or maybe cohort C. Just uh, bridge two decisions. Here is the the, the diagram show uh, how this, uh, how we choose this, the devices. If we have the cardiac arrest, go V A ECMO. If we have the severe hypoxemia, go V A ECMO. If we have the RV failure, isolated RV failure, maybe impella devices. And if we have a RV failure, pre shock, maybe IABP is choice. 
or severe shock amphala or refractory shock may be go to the VA ECMO. Here is the upcoming trial of, to answer the question uh, for the cardiogenic shock. We have a danger trial, ECLS shock trial, ECMO, CS shock trial, Euro shock trial that will have uh, the answers maybe in a few years. For about the high risk PCI, we have PROTEC4, uh, randomization compared with an impella or no impella in high risk PCI. Maybe we have the answer in the next uh, few years. So in conclusion, our MCS device have the same limitation and contraindication. I think careful case selection is the key. And the high-risk PCI planning and prepare for the worst still, still are the key. And bail our MCS device is another option. In cardiogenic chart, monitoring early escalate therapy with MCS device is the key to break the downward spiral. And um, implementing best practice and developing chart team are associated with improved outcome. Uh, thank you for uh, for uh, for uh, our kind of interaction uh, attention. Thank you, Doctor Siri uh, Shai. That was an excellent uh, review and lecture. Um, I believe in many parts of the world, especially in in, in some of the part of the world, like in Asia, uh, we have some part that um, uh, may not have all the mechanical support device available. For example, here in Thailand, we only have uh, balloon pump and VA ECMO. Uh, we may have um, uh, a, a, a few minutes for, for discussion, or question and answer. Um, I, I would like all the panelists to turn on their, their microphone. Oh, um, perhaps just one quick question, Dr. Siri Shai. Uh, um, in, in one or two sentences, when do you decide to go for IABP and when do you decide to go for uh, a VA ECMO? Okay, uh, so I, I'm because of the complexity of the, the VA ECMO, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to go to the IABP first. And uh, if uh, we don't have the good or uh, economic data, like from the Swan Gang catheters or the lactate level or or some kind of the uh, sign of uh, deterioration, we uh, escalate to the VA ECMO. I think because of VA ECMO has a very complex management and need the team work. Uh, so many uh, involvement from the uh, CCU intensive with proficientness and especially in the cardiac uh, CVT surgeons. So I think I, I just try to escalate the treatment. Okay. Yes. Um... We probably have to move on to our uh, case presentation. We have, uh, I would say, the sickest of the sickest cases that our case presenter uh, uh, have chosen for us today. I uh, will start with our first case. Our first case will be presented by Dr. Subhavad uh, Ratanapo. He is from the uh, Royal Army Hospital or Pramukutka Hospital. And his title is Life Without Rotational Arthrectomy. Dr. Supawat, if you're ready, please go ahead. Uh, this is my title, Life Without Rotational Arthrectomy. Actually, it's a mild name for this case. Uh, actually, we need more many devices. Let's go to the case. Uh, 83 years old Thai male present to outside hospital with a progressive short of breath, chest pain for one week. At the outside hospital, they have done workup, did the echo, show severity, reduced EF with a severe AF, and they did angiogram for the patient. Then they call us uh, to transfer, phase, transfer the patient at the middle of the night because the patient is getting worse. When the patient arrives to our center, his blood pressure is 80 over 50, and oxygen saturation is only 85% on room air. He was uh, intubated and then give a vice suppressor uh, to tell hemodynamic support. We diagnosed him as an ACS in semi with cardiac shock and pneumonia. This is uh, a angiogram from outside hospital. The RCA seems non dominant with a sub -spermosis. On the left query side, the patient has a severe calcified lesion, have a mid circumflex lesion, uh, 99%. The patient also have a long diffuse osteo to mid LAD uh, lesion. Moreover, when, when you notice, the patient also have a distal left main with a calcium shelf uh, into the LAD. 
this uh, ECG on arrival, the patient have a QVF in the anterior wall with a low R voltage. The X-ray show like a right lower lung infiltration, maybe from aspiration or pneumonia. This uh, echo at uh, our institution shows severely reduced EF less than 50%, and the patient have severely calcified uh, aortic valve. We thought the patient have a low oral gradient AF in this situation. So in the lab, the patient have troponin T more than 2,000. The patient have a metabolic acidosis with the AKI and lactic acid 3.67. We have to increase um, the vasopressor as a norepinephrine no on the high dose for the patient. Then it's, it's question to be answered for this case. The patient presented with a cardiac shock with a CVAAS, low EF, and calcified multi-vessel chorea 3 disease. What would you do next? I think uh, for my option, maybe an uh, emergent uh, bypass and uh, do an aortic valve replacement. Do we need uh, any uh, advanced hemodynamic support to bridge to the OR? Or if the patient uh, was turned down, what should we do? Or we send the patient for palliative care because uh, everything we do will put quality to the patient and we should stop at this point. So uh, we call the surgeon at the middle of the night and uh, we was turned down twice. This is an STS score with a mortality uh, more than 38%. So then uh, the patient meet the uh, all criteria of a chip as a critical, anatomical, or hemodynamic criteria. So I think we need some support. And as Dr. Sri Shai told us, we have only a uh, IABP and uh, the ECMO device. And then we have the question, should we uh, share the valve first or we correct the blood vessel first? The data, there's no available in the patient with a shock, but uh, them not much different in the stable patient. Or if we have a some support, should we do a multi-vessel PCI or just a culprit only lesion? These are data from a national shock initiative with a user impeller device for support. And then what if we want to intervene the patient, should we what what would we do with a calcified lesion? I think a rotational arterectomy may be only one device for heavy calcified. And the patient have uh, many contraindications to the use of rotational arterectomy in this patient. So these are what I really wish for. We did a TAVI emergent at night. Then we place an impeller through the TAVI valve. And then we do a PCI uh, to the alcalcified vessel. But it not happened with a limited result. So this are another wish. We may do a balloon facilitated uh, the impeller to insert through the aortic stenosis, and then I do the PCI nicely. Then send the patient for OR later. Maybe I can put a VA ECMO, and then I have a time for PCI and a TAVI in the morning. Other option, just put a supportive device and pray, wait until the morning with the surgeon feel better, and take our chest to a surgery or we do a ship PCI alone with uh, some uh, support device, hope the patient will be better. I quite concern to use the BAV only because uh, our device, either IABP or ECMO, is not working well with the AR. So in the fact, the patient was turned down and we don't have any, uh, we cannot do any agenda TAVI. Our center is pretty new and lack of this experience. I concern about consequence of BAV and we have only a limited resource on the support. So what, uh, what did we do? Uh, we do an angiogram to both groin and we decide to put the seven French sheet uh, to the right and uh, use a balloon pump first to see that the patient can tolerate the procedure or not. Then uh, we do an angiogram and um, it, the result is almost the same as we had. Then I started to use a uh, to wide the surf and try to pre-dilate the surf. Luckily, uh, we can dilate the lesion. We can use the NC balloon and they can place then uh, to the mid first with a balloon pump support. This is a result after we put the uh, then to the third. Um, I think we got an optimal result at this point. Then we go for next task. What uh, would I do with a severely calcified LED lesion? At that time, it's almost midnight. Should I do an ad hoc rotational arterectomy at midnight in the patient with shock? So what uh, did I do? I used a uh, cutting balloon, slowly inflate one each ATM at a time uh, to the proximal and mid-LED lesion. 
Luckily, I could I could dilate the vessels and we use a follow or NC balloon. The balloon expand well, so uh, I decide to place the stent to the from the distal left main to the mid LAD and post dilate up to a four O in the distal left main part. And this is a final result after we did a PTI. We still have a mid calcified LED lesion, but I think now flow is better. We observe the patient in the cat lab. We can wean down the norepinephrine a little bit in the cat lab at that time. The patient seems to be more stable. So I think we should stop at this point, not go further to attack the valve at the middle of the night. So the plan, we want to wean off the IADP, we treat the pneumonia, and consult maybe elective tower in a couple of days when the patient more stable. But uh, we win successfully the first battle at the middle of the night, we lost on the war. The patient looking good for three days and on the day four, the patient developed septic shock. Our family member meeting with the heart team and family decide to DNR DNA for the patient and stop a treatment. So we lost the patient on the day five. So. Uh, from this care, uh, I think I would like to discuss about the strategy for the patient with a severe AS and multi-query artery disease with a shock. There's no guideline available yet. What type of mechanical support would you recommend in this care and the strategy for plaque modification in the patient with shock? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sipawat. That was a, an amazing uh, case presentation there. Um, Perhaps I start uh, off with uh, Dr. Natawood from City Rad. If if this were to be uh, arriving at your hospital, what what would you do? What would you do, Dr. Natawood? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Watson. I think this is a very uh, challenging case, and the doctors for what have been discussed very well. What the option? So uh, I think uh, first of all, I would like to point uh, some problems that we. Uh, uh, what challenging on this case? I mean, I mean, acute setting with the uh, uh, cardiogenic shock. I think when you want to evaluate for the valvula, it's difficult. I mean, you want to do TAVI. I mean, obviously you can size thing with the echo, but when you have to plan for TAVI that have no contraindication such as low coronary height, calcify STJ. In that case, if you do something, maybe worse. So I think that one problem. The second problem: what is the underlying etiology? So this case could be pneumonia, make him worse, and maybe that the cause of the patient who are stable and pneumonia as a trigger. So I think this is a very challenging in this situation. So I have three points and I approach a patient like this. First point, uh, uh, what should we do? Is this AS or is this uh, coronary as a cause or is this uh, 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 after precipitating like infection? I mean, obviously with the history, you can get, I mean, maybe pneumonia as a cause, but when I dealing with the AS uh, with coexisting coronary artery disease, I would like to know what the gradient. Uh, I mean, if the patient uh, in this case have the low output, low flow, low gradient, it will be difficult. But if the patient have document that AS is like a very high gradient, I think AS is the problem. Then I will fix uh, uh, correct with the with the AS first and uh, coronary after. And uh, if you don't have the prior gradient, uh, usually cut off, my cut off is like a 60 millimeter gradient. In that case, I will be very careful because fixed output, if I make something with coronary, is make uh, AS worse. Uh, the second uh, point, uh, what would you do? I mean, uh, even you're dealing with this case, you have three options. Send for surgery. In this case, uh, surgeon is refused. And even though the surgeon accept, the mortality is about 30%. The second, I mean, if AS is a problem, uh, you have choice between the balloon bubbleoplasty and stabilize the patient and bridging. But you have to be careful because if the balloon bubbleoplasty costs significant AR, you make my thing, thing worse. So what I do, I, if I deal with this patient, I will do like a balloon, but not full size. And I just, uh, just uh, correct the AS, get some flow. And, and, and if they have some specified SDJ, I don't dissect it. So, and then I will try to bridge the patient. For coronary standpoint, uh, I think, uh, uh, I mean, if the coronary is a main part uh, and you want to fix it with the calcify, I think obviously a lot of better with cardiogenic shock. If you have no flow, it might make the thing worse. So imaging might help you. 
uh, intravascular cells. Uh, uh, if you see the calcium with liver rating, I think it can make your decision. And what doctor support do, I think is, is really the best outcome. And the third point is the mechanical support. Uh, depend on the patient. I mean, you sometimes you may have to do at before if the patient human being cannot stabilize with medication before you do the procedure. But if he can stabilize, I will see what is the, what practice level, what is cardiac output. Uh, maybe I sometimes I put the swan cans and, and make that decision that I will put him on ECMO afterward or not. So that will be my three recommendations uh, that I make uh, in contemporary before I make decision to, to do what to or not to do. Because all the cardiac shock with AS, not all the patient is the same. It's a, it's a worry on the patient. You're right. Thank you. We have about 30 seconds left. Any other comment from any of the other presenters or panelists that might be different from, from what Dr. Uh, Dr. Wood said or what Dr. Supawat did? I guess it, it, it will depend on your assessment at the time, whether severe right. is or severe or the coronary was the culprit. Uh, a lot of time, if the coronary flow is, is jeopardized, I, I guess we were kind of um, forced to fix the core first. And then if you could do an urgent, urgent uh, uh, TAVI, that would be ideal. On, on this case, I'm, I, I might even think that maybe patient just precipitate from pneumonia. Yeah, <laughs> and be. because coronary look very chronic and maybe a low flow located is there, but then, uh, and that even though you fix, you do everything, you cannot correct it because uh, of the condition of the patient and the septic uh, degree. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yes, good question. Thank you for what. Um, Dr. Okay. Virat, can you introduce yes. us? Uh, the next presenter will be uh, Dr. Naradip Chunhamuni from the Department of Cardiology, uh, Sri Lat Hospital, uh, Maidon University. Uh, he will present in the topic of the heavily calcified lesion with uh, poor LVEF. Uh, go on or give up. Uh, Dr. Naradip, please. Thank you, Dr. Virat, for your invite, uh, your kind introduction, and um, thank you uh, for uh, invitation um, to this um, to this lecture. Um, I have a very sick lady. She's a, a 61 years old female who presented with heart failure with reduced LEF. The echocardiogram showed EF of 32 percent. She had history of uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. And she's the fourth one from her family that became my patient. Um, she had angiogram done from outside hospital that showed triple vessel CAD with heavily calcified lesions. I strongly um, recommended um, cabbage to her, but um, she declined. Um, her medications included DAPT, Losartan, uh, and Dapacliporzin for heart failure with LEF. And this is um, mm. this angiogram. On that day, she was quite dyspneic and she had um, some degree of autopnea. Um, her LVDP was 40 in the cat lab. Um, we saw short CTO segment with um, possible microchannel um, at RCA. Um, the left coronary artery show um, distal left main stenosis, diffuse circumflex stenosis, two tandem lesions in proximal and mid LAD, and all of them are heavily calcified. So my strategy was um, I started with RCA first. Um, I thought CTO was um, probably short and I had a good chance to pass through with um, future STA guide wire. Um, with high LEDP, I tried to do balloon angioplasty work first. And if it doesn't work, then doing a rotational attractomy. Um, uh, because of the cost concern, I did not put balloon pump or even pacemaker in um, upfront, but I might consider them later if she becomes unstable. And after um, the first procedure, I will um, send her home and then optimize medical treatment first, and I will bring her back after heart failure symptoms improve. Um, this is the first PCI um, going from right where to approach. Um, use seven French um, shot tip and plus left guide catheter with side hole. And um, with some manipulation, I pass feeder XTA guide wire um, to the CTO. Um, however, I couldn't advance course apro micro catheter uh, across CTO. Uh, I thought because um, 
it was heavily calcified. So I passed um, the filter ST guidewire into um, this RCA, started with CTO balloon 106 millimeter balloon, and then escalated semi compliant balloon up to 2.5 millimeter. And at this point, you'll see there was um, a dog born because um, the lesion was not the legible. Um, Angiogram did not show significant dissection. So I decided um, to do rotational atrectomy at this point um, using um, extra support guide wire and use 1.5 millimeter burr. Um, it was not too difficult to, um, to pass in and she was quite stable. Um, there was no bradycardia, there was no hypotension. And you see that, you know, it was not too difficult to pass 1.5 millimeter burr. And then I finished double on um, this procedure with um, 2.75, 29 millimeter stent. And then um, I sent it home and then I um, put her on some more medications. Actually, she was um, better after the first procedure, partly because um, she behaved better. You know, she's, um, her diet compliance is better. She didn't have more salty food. And then I added low dose beta blocker. Um, I put Valsatan up to the maximum dose, continue Dapagliflozin, and bring her back about four weeks later for the second procedure. And you see at this time, LVDP came down for, from 40 to only 15. Um, the same starting from um, right radio approach and uh, try to uh, intuit um, pelvic calcify lesion with a rot rotational atrectomy. Um, so I did roll the bladder um, using 1.5 millimeter, millimeter burr in our LAD. Um, and uh, after pre dilatation, I placed um, two five 33 millimeter um, drug looting stand in mid LAD and then turned my attention to circumflex. And I thought, you know, it, this was the most difficult vessel in, uh, in this case. Um, the, the circumflex lesion was very diffuse and you see that there was some difficulty um, from osteo circumflex um, all the way down to distal part. And I, I did many, many runs of um, rotational atrectomy. And then after pre dilatation, I place, um, I plan to do DK crutch. In this case, I place uh, 2.75 um, by 29 millimeter um, in circumflex first, and I chose 3018 millimeter stent, um, placing the stent from left main extending to circumflex. And then I crush the stent uh, in the left main. Um, with 3515 non compliant balloon, and I used the same balloon to do further pre dilatation in left main. Um, because of um, heavily calcified lesions, there, there were some resistant um, in proximal LED with the, uh, with the big balloon. Unfortunately, everything came out. And then I rewired our LED with um, run through um, floppy guide wire. And um, for some reason, a small balloon couldn't pass to LAD. Um, this is what happened. I think, you know, I, I chose um, the stent in, um, in a left main extending to circumflex. That was a little too long and um, the crutch was incomplete. And uh, this is um, the cartoon that I probably show uh, the problem in, in left main. So I, um, I corrected this problem with um, stent ablation because I have one millimeter burr on the table already. So after um, so um, after everything, I did um, rotablator the blader um, in left main. Um, after I converted my strategy to uh, modify crutch technique, I placed the last stent on um, three five times twenty six um, stent and then uh, did kissing balloon inflation, and then um, don't forget to finish the case with pot. And this is f uh, my final result. So the patient did well after the procedure and she got like um, everything that the guidelines recommended. And she was quite happy with uh, her decision at this point. So this is my take home message. I think guideline directed medical treatment is at least as important as good PCI strategy and technique and advanced medical surgery support could be avoided when optimized medical treatment and good PCI strategy were applied. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Dr. Naratip. Um, that was an excellent um, case there. Um, had a comment on this, on the yeah. point of this medical optimization and, and the PCI strategy that was chosen? Uh, first of all, I have to congratulate for Dr. Naratip for doing the very well PCI in this case, but, but when you compare the angiogram from the first case and secondary second case, you can see that the severity of the anatomy is not different much, but the first clinical presentation is different. One is the situation of the heart failure and decompensating, but the, the second case is just only the volume overload and my heart failure with a high LVEDP. So in this situation, we, we have to know that when the anatomy of this case is quite a long period of time. So the patient can, can have the precipitating factor from other cause and not from the crutch. So when you attack in this case, you just select the, the lesion that you, you can fix it very easily and, and reduce the area of ischemia in this patient. And waiting for a time when the patient recovery from, from from precipitating of heart failure and attack the other vessel. Like Dr. Narrative showed that he do the CTO first because after he fell, he can convince patient again to do the surgery or, or do, do the, but if he co collect the RCA and the patients get well, you can see that the LVDP is lower and we can arrange everything more safer for her to do the other vessel. So this is the kind that what we can do for the monthly vessel and poor VEF, but I'm not recommend to do the aggressive PCI like this when the patient was really this near warm and had a high inotropic level with our mechanical support. If you have this situation, the mechanical support, even though IABP or ECMO, you have to stand by and ready to use in this case. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Now, uh, we still have plenty of time to discuss for this patient. So um, let, let's see if, um, I guess in this case, when Dr. Naratip started doing his right coronary, um, he, he uh, obliged to do uh, rot rotational arthrectomy because the balloon couldn't pass. But for someone with LVEDP of 40, um, uh, is there any precaution that you want to tell everyone doing rot rotational arthrectomy with high, yeah, during high EDP period, Dr. Anurag? Yes, in this situation, you have to do very fast, just, just modify the lesion and, and try to, to do without uh, complication. If you <laughs> face these complications from the rota again, maybe you have to call everything you have in the catalog, like the IABP ECMO. So, so when you do this kind of case, you have to, to know yourself that you're confident enough to do and complete this, this procedure successfully without any complication. Other thing that I want to mention is you have not to lose any small side branch. You don't let a patient have some area of infection or ischemia more. In, in the poor VEF in this situation, like, it, like he do the RAD lesion, you can see the big diagonal branch. You have to do the PCI with any compact PCI to open the RAD, but don't lose that diagonal. Or sometimes if you do the PCI and lost some septal branch, we can lose that, this kind of patient if you lost some major branch. And, and I think you also uh, have to know not only your patient, but also know the lesion. I mean, some rota better. If, I mean, if you need a multiple blur and bigger advanced blur that might cause no reflow, they, they might cause a problem behind our LVDP at 40. But I think it's a good thing that Dr. Nartips look at LVDP and target one and staging after. But I have a question that uh, I'm sure that you do left main with imaging. And instead of putting a uh, rota better in that sense, that not complete crush, why don't you use imaging to guide and maybe leave crush? Uh, I think that might be easier. 
because, because nothing passed that <laughs> that junk in left main, or oh, um, oh, I, I had to wire um, or the floppy wire. <laughs> Oh, I see. Okay, <laughs> so you cannot get to the uh, true strat. Okay. Got so it. other things, Doctor Nathwood, when when I do this yeah. kind of case, I think we just keep flow and finish everything. And yes. and for the long term result, like the the I was maybe we can next to check everything like one or two months. Just, but just make sure that acute complication will not occur. But complete right. and and make everything perfect, like the imaging perfect for the long term result. Maybe next session. So so this kind of case we have to spend a lot of money on, on this <laughs> kind of patients. Thank you. Okay. I think we have to wrap up the second case. I think the take, key takeaway message would be when you deal with with uh, uh, having to, when you have to do TCI in in someone with very high EDP, but not that as sick as the first patient. I guess optimization with medical treatment is one thing you could do. And also you have to have precaution and all the backup tools um, um, should any complication occur. Like Dr. Narati, I'm sure he has balloon pump nearby. And also when he did the right quarry, he probably put in a temporary pacemaker um, um, uh, while doing that. I, I, I think I saw that on the angiogram. Well, let, let's move to our third case. Um, our third case, will be presented by Dr. Tanawat Sisa from Kongan Hospital. The title would be High Risk PCI of Left Main Bifurcation in a Patient with Poor Left Ventricular Ejection Fraction. Dr. Tanawat, please. Thank you, Dr. Wasin, for introductions. Good afternoon, moderator, panelists, and everybody. My name is Tanawat Sisa from Kongan Hospital. I have no disclosure. My case was 89 years old woman, I see you know as a mother, presented with chest pain and congestive heart failure. She has frequently admission four times in six months. She has instant renal disease with regularly hemodialysis. The latest cardiomyopathy was diagnosed six months ago with medical treatment and refused to angiogram previously. EKG show normal standard rhythm and generalized AC depressions, echo show LV dilatation, Global LV hypokinesias, LV ejection fraction 22%, and mildly uh, valve regurgitation. Lab show uh, some an anemia and high sedum pitidinins, elevated troponin 3, standard medical treatment as non steamy with constituted heart failure, and extra dose of hemorrhagic was done. In this admission, patients were advised to angioclams after congestion and heart failure improved. Angioclams were performed by my colleagues. This left system show heavy calcification, severe distal left main stenosis with bifurcation, Medina 111, with total occlusions, osteocircumflex, and uh, fan collateral, fan bridging collateral, calcifications, and stenosis as proximal to mid LED and involve big diagonal blanch. All right, system show no significant stenosis. So in conclusions, patient has double vessel disease with left main bifurcations with CTO or CO circumflex with unclear stump and heavy calcifications, high LV EDP pressure. We calculated that syntax score was 54 with preferred cabbage over angioplasty. However, ATS score also really high maturity above 50%. This is a very high risk case from comorbid disease and complex anatomy with cells. We discussion with heart team and patients uh, in heart team conference. Surgical was turned down by CVT surgeon because of very high risk. So if the PCI is very high risk too, patients and her daughter decide to uh, no surgery and refuse to PCI too continue medical treatment. Unfortunately, two weeks later, readmission again with non steamy and heart failures. Uh, patients suffering from chest pain and readmission. So this admission, patient and her daughter changed decision to do angioplasty. Cardiac MI was performed in this admission to check viability and viable or myocardium segment. 
I plan PCI to left main LED and I will try to open second flex. If fail second flex or too difficult, sacrifice it and just stand left main LED. I concerned about heavy calcifications from angio gland and maybe need arteriectomy. And I think about hemodynamic support for complex anatomy with poor LV function. And I have only IBP available. For hemodynamic support, we use Protec PCI algorithm. If we calculate score more than four, strongly recommend hemodynamic support. In this case, score six. IABP, uh, most of study don't support routinely use pre procedural IABP for high risk PCIs. But IABP still plays in practical approach because maybe have a role in very high selective subgroup, especially in very high risk patients or a large amount of myocardium at least, and in the situation that you don't have uh, other choice. Before PCIs, patients have bradycardia and hypercaremia, temporary pacemaker was insert for heart rate backup and uh, hemodiasis for extra dose. The day of PCIs, uh, I insert IBP before procedure uh, from left femoral artery and I use light femoral approach, seven French guiding. I start with small balloon to all balloons, uh, P dilatation at left main before I put I watch in. I was to calcifications along the left main to uh, mid LAD. Superficial calcifications at the proximal to mid LAD, uh, more than 180 degrees and length more than five millimeters. So I decided to use arterectomy in this case. Plus modifications was done by rotabrator 1.5, uh, three lungs and followed by none uh, NSE scoring balloon 3.0. This is the results after plus modification. And I try to open uh, CTO circumflex with pilot 50 with flight card, but fail. So I change to pilot 200 and I use the lumen micro catheter for more backup support and can cross the CTO, uh, shakes distal length off, and then sequential dilatation with AC and NC balloon. After dilatation circumflex, uh, I cannot put the IWAT a pass to mid part of second flight because of uh, heavy calcification and severe angulation. I plan to arteriectomy for second flight. But in this time, patient developed congestive heart failure, dyspnea, and agitations after 15 minutes pass, uh, left arm left. So I must hurry. And it should choose what insert through the patients. I start uh, put LED stand. First, with dilating stent, 3O by 18 and overlap position with uh, 3.5 by 24 come in left main. And then uh, I try to place position of the circumflex stand with very difficult. So I use the Gaisila guide extension uh, for place circumflex stand and then deploy it for mini clutch technique. and clutch by left main LED stent, rewind and teasing. And then I put with uh, four millimeters NC balloon and it is the results. I check I was again to back from LED to left main to a uh, good uh, position. After PCI, we use around 100 uh, cc of contrast, uh, kind of IBP and of endotracheal tubes. Patient can discharge three days after PCI and now follow up regularly at high field clinic without readmission for six months. Some improve of LV function. In conclusion, for keep case, uh, I think two minutes to for keep case is independence of hospital. It depends on your experience and for your practical approach. And I think it's very important to permit more complete offering of treatment option for the patients uh, rather than uh, look at your time only. It is to ship case in my center. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Tanawat. Um, I think all of us would agree that we uh, like to go have to see all these you know, cases every day in our work. Dr. Uh, Virat, could you care to comment uh, um, on, on this case? Yes. Uh, first of all, I have to congratulate with this uh, excellent result of a very complex case. I think this case is uh, quite difficult to make decisions since uh, this is a case that you have to deal with the uh, many uh, comorbidity, such as the heart, uh, that heart experience itself uh, concomitant with the uh, abnormal renal function and also have some anemia. So the uh, preparation of the patient before the operation is quite uh, essential. I think it is uh, very uh, difficult to maintain a good uh, uh, condition before the uh, uh, PCI. And once in the operation failed, you have to face this very complex situation. You have to pick up uh, with uh, vessel you should do first. I think in this case, a uh, difficult one is that uh, the occlusion of the circumference, we don't know really which uh, uh, is this a uh, uh, new region or, or the old region. Since the patient have a clinical presentation uh, almost six months before, and we cannot see any collateral to the circumflex itself, just only a uh, light uh, breathing or maybe a subtotal occlusion. So I I think by the uh, uh, the data from the viability study is uh, uh, guide us to uh, try to open this uh, circumflex too, but that may be a very uh, hard work. So I think uh, in the situation that you have no time and uh, the risk is too high. I agree that you should sacrifice the circumflex. But uh, if you have time and it is possible to open it, maybe more benefit. And uh, the angel can show that the left main anatomy is quite complex. So the choose of the uh, atrectomy device is quite difficult. But in this case, it's, uh, because of the uh, circumflex is not uh, present at the, the first time. So I think it's not difficult to make this change with the rotator. However, once you open the circumflex and you face with the uh, calcification in the ostium, now it's a difficult situation. I think uh, in the, uh, in the uh, country, developing countries, <laughs> like us, we still do not have the IVL available, but if it is available, it should be a very good chance, choice for the, the situation like this. Because you can do the IVL in the left main LED to break the uh, calcified region in the ostium of circumflex too. Uh, mm. And at last, uh, this is a very uh, good uh, strategy to do the, I, not, I think this is not a, quite a complex uh, uh, bifurcation strategy so that you can uh, finish this uh, quite a uh, uh, very uh, short time and the uh, patient can uh, tolerate the uh, operation so that uh, you can see that uh, the result is quite good and also the recovery of the patient is so well. So I have another point of discussion is that uh, for this complex situation, a complex patient like this, uh, the uh, choice of the stent for the SBR situation uh, um, uh, and as well as the uh, choice of the uh, DAPT or the uh, antipallet uh, should be considered. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vila. Thank you very much, Dr. Vila. Um, we have less than one minute left, so I, I think I should wrap up this, this session. Um, I think all of us see two different patients. All of them are very sick. Um, they came in with different degree of of urgency and different degree of hemodynamic decompensation. Um, all of us have limited access to mechanical su uh, uh, support device. But as you can see, the importance of uh, hemodynamic optimization, if we could do it with either medical therapy or, or other means, um, and also uh, choosing the strategy to minimize the hemodynamic alteration during the procedure, um, also minimize the complication that may occur, and also the backup strategy that we have to prepare when doing all these cases. And as you can see, um, um, two cases were done without the need of mechanical support. 
Uh, in one case, despite uh, intra-early balloon pump, the patients uh, began to decompensate during the procedure and uh, Dr. Tawad had to hurry up to finish his case. And um, I guess the strategy um, may have to change uh, along the way well, when, when things kind of uh, develop or the patient get worse. So um, with that, I think um, being interventional cardiologist is, is not always easy. And, uh, and, and dealing with this sick patient is something everyone or all of us will have to deal with, um, um, unfortunately, not too, too frequently. So with that, uh, I would like to thank TCTAP to have us uh, um, as part of the meeting and would like to thank all the lecturer, case presenters and panelists uh, to participate in this session. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Uh, uh,